Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to this week's edition of the Digital Shop Talk Radio. I'm Tom Dorsey, and today we're going to be talking about should you have your technicians write an estimates in your shop? And, you know, it's one of those kind of, uh, you know, there's two, kind of, I guess you would say, extreme versions that we run across a lot in the, in the industry, right? Is you get, uh, you know, a shop that the techs are kind of in the back, they're in their cave, they're never allowed out, right? There's a lock on the door, and the service advisor is the main conduit and interface between the motorist and the shop. And they kind of run the, you know, call the shots. And then on the other extreme, you kind of get, uh, you know, well, maybe some shops, they don't have as much faith in their service riders. Um, maybe they've hired service riders for a different uh, role, you know, more as a customer service representative. And the technicians are the ones who are coming up and doing a lot of the uh, deeper dive and a lot of the work to build out those estimates and make those recommendations. And, you know, now with kind of the change in the technology uh, that we're experiencing, especially the improvements in the communication tools that we have, um, well, Auto Vitals has kind of opened up some possibilities. And so today we're going to talk about those possibilities. I've brought on two great operators and they both kind of somewhere in the middle. And I'll and I don't want to steal any thunder, and we'll let them get into it. But I'd love to welcome first Neil Daly from Oceanside Motorsports in Oceanside, California. Welcome back, Neil. Hi. And joining us, uh, welcome back, Bruce Nation from Westlake Independent in Westlake Village, California. Good morning. Good morning, sir. And we were going to have uh, Dave Murphy on uh, from Murphy's Auto Care, uh, but I think we had some some time zone conflict and he's on a plane. So uh, no worries. We'll have Dave on a future episode. You know, uh, if you've ever had a chance to meet Dave or, or see him in some of the shows and conferences that we do, uh, that's going to be a great show upcoming. So I'll tease it a little bit, look out for it because uh, you know, it's always uh, a treat and it's always a lot of value uh, talking with Dave Murphy. So we miss him. We'll see him soon. And then of course, Welcome my half of my expert panel of experts, Uva Kleinschmidt, founder of Auto Vitals. Welcome, Uva. Good morning. Good morning. And so let's just dive right into it, gentlemen, because the hour will run short because this is going to be, uh, I think, a pretty dynamic topic. And so out there in the uh, audience, make sure you got a pen and paper and you're ready to take some notes because we're going to open your mind to possibilities today. So if we could, let's talk a little bit about how, um, well, you know, Uva, some of the technology I think that we've, and, and some of the lessons we've been learning actually in the way that the shops implement the technology uh, has opened the door for a lot of possibilities. And for folks who are regular followers of the show, you probably heard us talking about a little change of roles and, and shops like John Long and Adam and and some of the others are out there pushing, you know, the production manager type role, which is a hybridization a little bit. And it's something that you probably wouldn't be able to do so successfully, you know, in a paper-based shop or back before we had, uh, you know, the ability to leverage this communication and workflow management technology. Uh, Uva, if you could give us a little insight into what we're kind of learning through our turbo group, uh, some of the things that we're working on development and how we're structuring some best practices around some of the stuff that we are learning about the improvements in communication at the shop level. Happy to do that. Let me just start with really some, some basic stuff which came in when the digital inspection got introduced and and we were, you know, plain forward thinking technicians put comments on the notes and the inspection topics and they went straight to the customer. And then we got some very, let's put it in wall feedback, which was, how dare you, we can't do that, right? It, there has to be some quality control on the language and and whether that's an educational topic and so on. So we introduced um, the separation of what we call shop eyes only view and the customer view, where then the service advisor or the person whoever is responsible for uh, the presentation to the customer would have the last word. 
on what is being presented. And, and that was kind of the beginning um, of what you mentioned with, you know, changes in communication, right? And, and to this day, we have uh, often an involved discussion on can I take text comments and go give them directly to the customer, right? And, and it has a little bit to do with a slightly exaggerated um, question should text wide estimates, right? So, so to what degree is the information a, a tech can put there um, relevant to the customer or not? And, and I would love if I don't wanna, I don't wanna steal your thunder. I, I, I would just ask Bruce and, and, and Neil how you have started using, for example, the shop eyes only and customer notes and, and, and put a process around it. Uh, and, and maybe we can talk about how that process evolved over the years. Sure, why don't we kick it off with Neil? Um, you know, because I think, you know, Neil, Neil we, we, we met with Neil uh, yesterday and, and Bruce and, and, you know, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to steal any of Neil's center, but really interesting concept and really close to the production manager type role. We're just calling it maybe something a little different. Can you give us some insight, Neil, into how, you know, to answer Uva's question, how you're evolving that and, and kind of what opportunities do you see uh, before you as you structure that role? Yeah, so I think we, um, you know, we all know that if our techs aren't holding wrenches, then they're not making us any money for themselves. And um, so them creating estimates as like, you know, I mean, every shop can do it their own way, but that doesn't make a ton of sense. But with the more information that they can give the service team about the work that's needed on the car, the better and the smoother their repair will go on that car. So we use the shop eyes only feature for the technician to recommend uh, labor times and the parts needed to fix stuff. Our, pro our process has it required for anything that's a diagnostic. So they don't have to do it for everything this car needs mm -hmm. um, because especially like in Bruce's shop, they're working on the same stuff all the time. And you know, most of the stuff in the inspection, we can figure it out on the service counter how to quote that. But on a diagnostic, it's really, really important that we get exactly what the tech wants to fix that. Um, so we require them to give the part numbers. Um, you know, they, they still have an estimator to find that stuff for them if, if they need, but um, we use the customer eyes to say what, you know, the diagnostic process and what's wrong with it. And then shop eyes only has a recommended labor time and the parts needed to fix that concern. Um, and then our model in our shop, uh, instead of having your service advisor that's just in the middle of everything that does all jobs, we split the roles so that one person is a rear facing advisor, basically our estimator. And then we have a front facing advisor that's like a customer service um, person. So she's super bubbly, really great with customers, not crazy knowledgeable about cars, although she's like really getting there. But our back end guy is really technically, um, you know, he, he, he's a car guy, he knows a lot about it. And we rely on him to do all the estimates. And then um, I guess that's what you would call kind of the production manager. I think some people are using technicians for that, right? Are you, because I, when I thought production manager, I kind of, I kind of think foreman. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's not exactly how, how we roll, but the, uh, that rear facing advisor has been a really, really huge success for us. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, and yeah, in some shops, it is more of a tech base role, like a foreman. Some it's more of a writer estimator type role, production manager, really focused on uh, also doing the dispatching, but there are plenty of shops, you know, uh, that, that do have that lead tech or that foreman tech that does dispatching also. So um, I think it's really depends on your operation. Your volume has a big, big, uh, you know, thing to do with it. The type of work that you're doing, because like you said, you know, Bruce is a specialty and he specializes. And so a lot of that stuff can become more uh, systemized and consistent. Bruce, how are you managing that in your shop? And how do you keep from you know, I guess robbing the technicians time, but still giving them a voice uh, to the motorist. 
Well, because we work on the same, mostly the same cars, we get uh, uh, the service advisor knows. He knows what this is going to pay. Everybody knows what to expect. Um, you know, a brake fluid flush, a trans flush, or a, a front brakes, rear brakes. All these things are, all these things are set up. Everybody knows how much they're going to get paid for it, and everybody knows the hours involved. Whenever you get past that, though, when you get to something different, something we haven't seen, or for example, I'm familiar with Honda. Um, not so much with Toyota and I get a Toyota and I need to go talk to the tech, you know, a control arm or something like that on a Honda's at 1.2. And then on a, you know, it's four hours on a Toyota of, of some different ones. And I, I don't really know the difference. And, uh, uh, so I'll communicate with the technician to make sure that everybody's on the same page. If it's something we don't understand, we ask questions, but leaving it up to the technician, I, I really don't, um, that's something the the message from the, the the messages that the customer will see will come in shop eyes only to the service advisor the service advisor then changes that to something that he wants the uh, uh, that he wants the customer to see you know something that you know sometimes he'll he'll push it you know a little further so if you don't do this you're you know you're gonna die in a fiery crash but um, and sometimes it's sometimes a technician will say something like that and he doesn't really want to present it to the customer that way that depends on on what we want to do um, but that needs to be up to the the service advisor um, and technicians are like are like service advisors in that it, it, we give them a lot of tasks you know this uh, the digital inspection is a is a task for them and it, it adds time to things so um, if we have to add even more time, then, then that's a, to me, that's, a, that's anti-productive. It just doesn't, uh, it just doesn't lead to more productivity in the shop from my view. The same thing with a service advisor though. Also, if you add more tasks to the service advisor, average repair order goes down. I think we all know that. And, um, so it's kind of a big deal. So I try to take tasks away in other ways, like answering phones, things like that. So service advisors don't answer the phone. Um, we, that's the biggest thing, managing phone calls really. Um, but um, we get information from the tech when we need it. Um, but when we don't, uh, we don't. And we always get the estimate made by the service advisor. But I like it. I like Neil's idea of the, the back facing service advisor doing the estimating because uh, uh, like the point Uva brought up yesterday was that uh, you can get uh, you can get a service advisor selling with their own wallet mm. a lot of times and whenever you get the back facing estimator uh, they've never met the customer they don't know about the the four starving children at home or or something along those lines if that yeah, no, if that makes sense point. yeah no definitely that's a great point and that's where that handoff can be very valuable right because you know, to what Neil said yesterday, it was that, you know, they just, they just do their job. You just tell them what to expect and they, they don't, they don't think anywhere beyond sell what's in front of them. This is what the estimator gave me. Here's what I'm going to talk to the customer about. I'm really not going to think too much into it. Right. right. Uh, I'm not going to, um, you know, sell uh, through my wallet. Um, but at the same time, what happens in that, in that translation, you know, that's a critical step right there and a lot can be lost or miscommunicated uh, and then it's either results in confusion to the customer or in the worst circumstance, it would be just an outright misinformation. Like you told me something else and now this guy's telling me this, what's going on here? Um, how do you prevent that? Actually, let me take that to Neil because Neil's got a little bit more experience running that type of a framework. Uh, Neil, how do you make sure that that communication is consistent and it's, uh, you know, I guess, um, quality controlled? So basically, as you're like playing the telephone game from what the technician says wrong with the car, and then it passes through multiple hands before it actually makes it to the customer, especially when our front facing advisor doesn't really start out as, as a car person. Um, I can't think of an exact example, but we know that there's some components that are called the same thing that are definitely, definitely different. There's a difference like a, like a fuel vent valve versus an exhaust valve. Uh, 
but they're both vowels. <laughs> so I can see how you could lose some communication and quote the wrong thing. Um, something that's really helpful in that and, you know, for, for the routine stuff, like your maintenance that you were talking about, Bruce, that should all be like can jobs. And yeah. it's even more rad when that is automatically done based off the inspection results, which I think you guys already have. I don't think I've set that up, but um, we're kind of more talking about the weird stuff. And most of the time when we need to present um, something that's a little bit more complicated or complex, um, the front facing advisor will take the inspection and the estimate back to the technician and say, hey, I'm selling the right thing here, right? And then she'll get a little bit more educated on it. Also give a chance to find any holes in the estimate. like oh no, like that one hour is to replace the exhaust valve once the cylinder heads off. Like <laughs> that needs to be 19 or something, you know? So um, that we've, we've used a process called the verbal contract from ATI. And that's where you take it back to the technician, make sure like, hey, I'm about to sell this. And once I sell it, that's it. You can't say it's the wrong job or you need more time or whatever. Like this is, we're doing the right thing, right? And then the second question to that is, is there any maintenance that we can, relate to this at the same time. Um, there is a digital way to do that. And we could do it by just, you know, like the technicians have our management software on it and we can just say, hey, log into the RO and make sure revision one looks good. So that's like a way to potentially save some time, but we are still doing the, the in-person thing where we'll, we'll print out the estimate and take it back to the tech and make sure it's right. Yeah, and so that's a little bit, uh, well, I mean, there's it takes some time to do that, right? Um, matter of fact, it's another thing that happens, too, can be com inconsistent when we're busy. Um, what were you going to say, Neil? It looked like you were going to have Yeah, Bruce said this, too, and it got me because, you know, um, the, the potential savings in, times from take, in time from taking that 30 seconds or a minute, even if it's longer, is so much more worth, you know, not having an O-ring for the job or like that snag, like when, when the tech is ready to go and fix the car, any kind of snag after that point is a huge red flag for me. And I would so much rather take a couple minutes ahead of time uh, to try to prevent any of that. Uh, like before starting a job, open all the boxes, you know, how many times have we gotten halfway through a job and then they open the box and they're like, holy crap, this is the wrong thing. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and then your rack's dead and so is your production for that day. So, um, yeah, it's, it's taking a little bit of time now to try to save it later. Yeah. And the investment of, of that time, that step is, you know, uh, I, I, I can see it as, is, is a critical step. Um, it's just, do, does it have to be a manual step does it ha or, or can it be automated i mean Uva, what are your thoughts along there after we had that discussion yesterday i'm sure you had some secondary thoughts there throughout the day on how we could help as neil was just talking i'm i immediately thought about there might there might have might have to be um, another workflow step which gets automatically entered the moment the estimate is done and there's a tech sign off. I definitely consider that. Um, that would be, uh, I think that's basically what we're doing. You know, anything that's not routine, uh, right. we're checking with it. We're making sure that the, are these the parts you need? And, and sometimes as you ask the, the technician and, and make sure are these the parts you need, that's when the technician remembers another part that he hadn't thought of. You know, it's, <laughs> You know, so it, it, it definitely helps to get out there and get with the technician, make sure that the technician has everything he needs. And, uh, you know, because he's the technician, he's the guy fixing the car. He need, he's the right. one that knows, should know best what he needs. Yeah. So I'm thinking about kind of a semi automated step, right? So you move the thing to the estimate in your workflow, which might send out the inspection results. Uh, automatically to the customer or manually. And at the same time, there's a task for the technician, you know, check this off, right? Because there's still some time to correct that until the customer has seen the inspection result and 
calls back or the service advisor calls the customer. So there could be work done in parallel without um, lengthening the whole process unnecessarily. Well, is that, is that something you, if you, you took like? the, I would love that, but if, let's say that right now we put together a repair order right. and uh, what if there was an option to, uh, to somewhere between creating estimate or waiting for authorization to waiting for work finished, just right in there where everything's made, the repair order is completely put together. Right. Um, and at this point, you're going to send it to the technician, but it's not going to be as a waiting for work finished. It's going to be waiting for your approval. So, so that's that, another workflow step. That's all that is. It's not going to send anybody anything, not going to send right. anything to the, to the customer. It's just going to go strictly to internal. the technician, strictly internal. I just want to avoid that we, you know, pile up workflow steps. So, so can we, well, well that could be we, used only when you want to use it. It doesn't have to be used on every job. Right. So the question is, how often does it happen? Because I heard you guys say, you know, maintenance jobs, easy, service advisor writes it down, you have 10 jobs, check, 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 check. So, so how often is what Neil calls the real job um, is going to happen? And, and you also said it's for every diagnosis diagnostic job, right? Which is probably on at least half of your vehicles in the, in the shop. Can you give us a kind of number? I think you're right. At, this happens? I think you're right at about half. And it, it really depends on how, you know, like, I'd say like mature your shop is, you know, that, you know, like Bruce probably does more maintenance than we do. And we always need to remind ourselves that we are a maintenance shop. But you know when you lose sight of that or you stop exit scheduling, all of a sudden you've got a week full of repairs. Um, so it, it does happen, I, I'd say most of the shops, at least half of the time is, is a repair versus a, versus a maintenance ticket, at least. Um, well, I believe that uh, even though there may be diag on a ticket, uh, I think that at least two thirds of diag on a ticket becomes routine once it's diagnosed. Okay, so I don't think on those in those instances, I don't think it's necessary either. So, so I would go down to say that, you know, if you're working on 15 cars a day, maybe three or four. Okay, something like that would be what I would say three or four, because I think that I think if you're working on cars, I think that pretty soon it just becomes for me, at least it becomes it becomes routine, even though there's diag. I think what, um, you know, like instead of adding, adding a workflow step, because you're right, it doesn't happen on, on enough cars for that to be relevant. Um, the workaround to it is to have the technicians have access to your POS. Um, if Auto Vitals did it, which you're kind of like taking on a giant feature request if you do this, um, you would need to make it possible to let the technicians see revisions, like we have revisions um, or an estimate before it ends up on the RO and sign off for it, because that's also what they're familiar to see. Like, I can't just right. print an estimate and bring it out to a tech. They're going to be like, what right. the heck is all this? That's a lot of money. Um, but if I print the tech worksheet that has part numbers and labor times, it's something I understand. Um, and that would be rad if it were digital. Um, but yeah. I would say send it to their iPad rather than print it. That's what I would like to see. But, but it still is not many revisions, it's one, right? It's an estimate. Yes. No. I'm not saying I have three options here. Hey, do you want to select the right one or is any of those right? I mean, it's one. I think you put together what you think is right as a service right. advisor, send it to them and they either approve it or disapprove. And if they disapprove, then they have to explain what's wrong with this. I think it's I mean, the process too. Um, because like we'll have four separate estimates for every car because we're quoting the big, we're quoting everything from the inspection. So you have the diag or the customer concerns and the reds, yellows and maintenance. Um, and if we put that all together, it would be like too confusing, but the technician also 
has the opportunity to go in and say, hey, even though this is a red, you should do this with the yellow at the same time because they're in the same area. That's the kind of editing that I think would be valuable uh, and is part of that kind of technician QC on the estimate. And, and w would it be actually a job specific thing? I can think of you mark somewhere a job or a job line or two or three on the estimate and say, hey tech, or specific tech name, can you verify? And we just turn that into a smart marker and done. Right? For this, there is no workflow step. It's because it doesn't happen so often. And, and I would also um, combine it with the question Adam is asking. You know, if the estimator was a skilled person from an estimating knowledge standpoint, could we just save that step? Yep. <laughs> well, I'm more of a process guy. I like to set up a process. So I believe whenever you, you set up the right process, it takes less skill. I don't I know if that makes sense to everybody because no, uh, skilled people right now is really a problem. Finding the right skilled person is, is really become a problem. And, and uh, I mean, you know, how long does it take somebody to train a, a McDonald's uh, worker? you know, because they got a process. I mean, it's hard to compare those two, but yeah. And of course we'd all love to have the, the estimator that knows everything about every car. But uh, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, we're in a time right now where it's very difficult to find these people. And I think that uh, the main thing is we get consistency to the, to the uh, customer and, uh, and good strong processes are what gets that to happen. Can I paraphrase what you just said? Yes. It is assumed that the techs know all this much more than the service advisor. Yes, but it's that that I would not assume that in my shop. I see. But the process to me is is everything. You know, what, what process does a service advisor and the estimator have that, uh, that gets the consistent message to the customer and to the technician? And, uh, and, and I think that's what we're talking about here. What should that be? And, and again, I might be out here on a limb, but how do we know that the tech comes back with four hours instead of two for example, in a service advisor who has no real ability to say, is four too high? Is he trying to get more yeah. work than necessary? There's no flag there at all, right? It's just- Yeah, constant. well, that's, you know, that you have to have some knowledge. There has to be some skill there. Um, I'm around a lot. I think Neil's around a lot. And, and when things like that happen, uh, you've, you've got to watch the guy. You've got to try to get the culture in your shop so that that doesn't happen. Right. So you would solve it through an audit or? Yeah, solve it through an audit. Um, well, you would try to catch it before it happens. Right. You know, before the job doesn't get sold because you're $250 or $300 too high on an estimate. But uh, um, that's a good point. But at the same time, you still, you know, there's, there's software to tell us what things should pay, and then we compare what it should pay to what the technician thinks. We do that a lot. So I got a job that pays three and a half in uh, Mitchell, and I go out to the, and I'll go check. What do you think? Mitchell says three and a half. What do you think? And they'll say, sometimes they say, well, three and a half is too much. Two and a half is right. Well, I, I might still get three and a half, but, uh, but at least I know I'm in the right area. You know, maybe it's his skill level that makes it two and a half. You know, and sometimes it's the opposite and you'll say three and a half and you'll say, no, no, that's at least five hours. You know, I don't know what's, what they're talking about here. Uh, these are most of what we deal with, you know, and then we, of course, matrix that. You know, and a lot of shops use the shop eyes only notes to, to help facilitate that though, right? I mean, they're going to put an hours estimate in there. They're going to put a parts list in there that help give guidance to the writer um, right there in the, in the uh, text recommendation. 
the parts list in our in my shop the parts list would come up as more part of the description of what repair is needed i need to replace x y and z you know there's your parts list along with it right and then uh at that point the you know we might go to uh you know i, I look up manufacturers parts uh, uh websites all the time and for example i'll go to honda parts now and i'll get a diagram of what we're wanting to do there and uh, it comes up pretty quickly and uh, you know he's saying well we need to replace a strut mount along with the strut for example and uh, so I'll pull up a, an exploded view of that strut and see what else I think he might need with it then I'll go and tell I say look this is what I got you know I'm ordering these other items with it would yeah. this be correct right 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 that's interesting and, you know, and to also to what Neil was saying, I mean, it, it might be as, you know, something like a checkbox in the inspection sheet where a technician can link recommendations together, right? We prioritize through the severity, but if I were to say, because like you said, hey, if I'm going to be replacing this, you know, we might as well do these other things. If the knuckle's coming off, we better be doing this too. Let me link these things together to give further guidance on how that should be communicated to the customer. Yeah, what are your thoughts, buddy? Yeah, if you, I think, um, you know, we're not talking about requiring like less skill in these positions. It's more for, for like our front, the split service advisors. It's more just more focused on either end. So the estimator rear facing advisor could be the guy that's combining those jobs together and kind of taking a, a logical approach to what they, what the, you know, instead of the tech doing all that, um, Again, the more the tech puts into it, the more they'll get out of it in the, on the repair side. But um, you do have to have a very skilled rear-facing advisor as far as car stuff goes. But you know, especially moving forward, and some people watching are probably just like, I don't have this problem at all, because you have a rock star service advisor. And what we're kind of prepping for is not having that one really, really good service advisor, which we know are out there, it is a lot easier to find a really, really good car guy that doesn't really have customer skills. And then someone that has great customer skills, skills that can work with that person. And that's kind of what we're, we're planning for. Um, and so he, yeah, he can catch that stuff and put it together. You know, if, if you're doing a oil pan gasket that's in the red, engine mounts are in the yellow, hey, we should do this all together. Um, and this is my recommendation for the customer. Yeah, don't sell one without the other. And here's what, how you explain why, right? What I might do in that in that instance is just as a service advisor, just change it from yellow to red. You know, I mean, I would know whether the it's a and my service advisor would certainly know. But I think as we look at the future, it's going to be hard to get that. And how do we? The big question is how do we do this? All of this stuff, all this stuff we talk about here is are good ideas. But how do we do it without? taking too much of the technician's time and too much of the service advisor's time. Yeah, that's, that, that's what goes through my, my head all the time, right? We can build the fanciest features. The moment they need another step, it's probably likely to not be used. Yes. We have to remove steps. We have to remove yes. steps. Yes, that's exactly right. So Adam had some interesting input right here. I don't know if you guys saw it in the chat, um, but he says he's been fortunate enough not to have to have the text do estimating so far. Uh, however, forward thinking, I have thought about the scenario, and I think my preference would be to develop team leads in the back where our A techs did the estimating for themselves and whoever they manage in their team. Uh, reason being, I don't want to slow down production. So while the A tech is building the estimate, uh, you know, the B techs are under uh, them can rack another car or something like that to keep the things moving. And that's almost that foreman type uh, role, right? Yeah, I've seen that model where they have um, all of the technicians doing inspections and then the foreman grooms them into the most logical approach for this car. And we've seen it, you know, if you just provide, here's an inspection, here's an estimate, and then go sell it versus a technician that comes and said, hey, I just did this inspection. This is what I think is really important for this car. 
and this would be also really great to do today, like they'll, they're so much more likely to sell that package that comes from the tech versus just what I'm reading from yeah. the, and from the inspection. So yeah. that's where that model really helps. I think um, Midwest Performance Cars does that um, with their foreman that kind of grooms and estimates everything, uh, at least the last time I talked to them. Yeah, have to, I, I'd want to watch closely the productivity of the ATEC in that situation. You know. I got the shop name wrong there. It's not those guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ricky out in Texas, I think, wherever they are. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's that same question, right? It's, it's just like taking the, you know, minute or two minutes or however long it was to get the tech to uh, sign off. Uh, before the estimate goes out to the motors, make sure that it's right because you're going to avoid all of those hassles that happen if it's wrong. Uh, this is kind of the same same way. You have to kind of do the math and, like Bruce said, observe what you know. What's the effect on that productivity? Is the little bit of productivity slippage worth you know? Uh, is that a smart investment because the results are so much better? We're we're selling bigger packages. Our ARO is increasing. Whatever might be uh, our efficiency is increasing um, and make that decision once I think you've done that analysis yeah look at look at both the shop productivity and the ATEC productivity and maybe the maybe the ATEC's going to need a little different compensation package for it but uh, uh, you know that, that all depends on you know you got to have a really consistent car count to have these processes work effectively all the time if that right. makes sense and, and so how big does a shop need to be so it even applies what we were talking about? Because I, I imagine a one service advisor, three tax shop wouldn't be able to afford that separation. Or am I That's, wrong? So, no, you're absolutely right, I believe. So so what do you, be, what? I would think around, somewhere around five techs. Okay. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, the thing too is, um, you know, moving forward, I think that model of one advisor for three techs is also getting harder to accomplish. But when you split the roles, you also don't have to ham crazy because they're not going crazy doing the one job. You know, we've right. burnt through advisors for years because it's so stressful. Yeah, um, burn them out. They are happier and you can get, you know, younger people that you can train. Uh, so you can kind of, you don't, I don't, you can't pay them half as much as an, as an advisor. So you do, I think have to up the budget on the advisor side, but I think two advisors to three techs is, is way more logical moving forward. Um, better if you can add a fourth, but. <laughs> or a, a backward facing forward facing like you were talking about, or the way I do it is service advisors with assistance. So I have an office assistant that does you know, for example, I'll put together a, they'll do all the documentation on a repair order. They'll do all the answering the phones, messages. Uh, if we make a, for example, if we're making an, an appointment, I don't just type it into the calendar. I put it down onto a, a phone message, you know, with a carbon copy or the carbonless copy, hand that to the office assistant. They add it to the calendar. Um, we do whatever we can to remove tasks from the service advisor. And so it, more service advisors to me is more expensive. Taking away tasks is uh, maybe a little better de depending on, you know, who your service advisor is and, uh, and what their capabilities are. Hey, Bruce, you said earlier that you uh, have removed answering the phones from, from the writers. Is that the office assistants that, that, that's yes. answering the phone? Yes, that's correct. Office assistant. Uh, office assistant does everything, greets the customers as they come in, uh, make sure that she has the name in front of the, uh, in front of the service advisor before a service advisor answers a phone, they, they know who's on the phone and what their question is, you know, is there, and is there a car in the shop? And so is um, she also doing the email capture and text opt-in and all that good stuff? Yes. Very all nice. of it. Very, yeah. very good. And that's a, and I, I split that up. I've got, I, I keep two part time. One works the morning, one works the afternoon. And uh, so there's no overtime involved. And uh, um, it's, 
it also keeps it consistent. So if one needs to be off, the other can cover the shift. Um, Cause it, it, that to me, not having an office assistant is to, would just that's really really bad i don't i can't remember a day that i just haven't had a, an office assistant even whenever even at lunch we have to overlap it so there's not even a lunch time where they don't we don't have them office assistants are there all the time and with you know we have scripts for phone answering we have a i actually have a complete uh, office assistant's handbook well wow. for that and it's, it's very very helpful and uh, um, I think it takes a lot of stress off of a service advisor because you don't know what you're going to get when you answer a phone. You just don't. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> Not really like that idea. I, I think that, you know, I mean, I see the value in it immediately, especially if it's a person who's really good at, you know, customer service and, and making de-escalations and stuff like that so that by the time yes. the rider gets on the phone with that person they're open-minded and solution oriented and not just wanting to rant for 15 minutes you know I mean, that's right well awesome. plus it keeps uh it for example i have an operations manager operations manager starts as a service advisor I have an operations manager and an assistant operations manager and the uh, operations manager position typically starts as an office assistant and works up into it as, you know, people move through. They don't. Uh, they don't want to be an office assistant forever. They're going to school. They're they're doing whatever they do. And you need to be able to uh, basically have a have a pipeline to these positions, and, and it works quite well that way. It's been good for me. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that being a training position. Um, yes. a lot of people have used the concierge role to make it so that your advisor can kind of like control their schedule a little better, which yes. again, relieve them from, from burning out for sure. I've seen um, that takes a lot of training to put that, because that concierge is so basically in charge of, of how many customers are getting in the door because they're the first, yes. uh, you know, the first person that a customer is going to talk to. Yeah, the, the right person in that position can make everything better. Yeah. You know, they really can't. Is, is that is that rule also filling holes in the schedule? Somebody drops. Uh, we just didn't have. You know, we had some openings, never got them filled. Are they out there on the phone uh, chasing business? Um, well, they do. Uh, as part of the overlap and schedule, ones uh, have an assistant uh, operations manager that'll that'll go in and break. Uh, you know, because they have to have breaks. You know, per California law and for for what they need. Um, so I'll have an office assistant, uh, I'll have a assistant operations manager go over, fill that position while they're on break and then we'll extend to the break and they'll do the uh, the phone calls, for example. They'll do our, our exit scheduling phone calls. Um, they'll uh, they'll go through our emails. They'll make sure when somebody's emailing in for, an, for, for anything, you know, customer emails in for an appointment, they make sure that gets in front of us. Uh, AAA emails a set of cars coming in on a hook. We get that in front of us. They're the ones that are watching this all the time, and it 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 really it really helps. If, for example, tomorrow a service advisor's off, and uh, and I have to step into a role over there, and it's not something I, uh, you know, I've done this a long, long time. I don't want to give away my age, but I've done this for a long, long, long time, and uh, and I'm not up for it. I'm just not up for running around and chasing everything all day long. And um, like a service advisor does. And so if, without an office assistant, I would have a really hard time getting it done. I would just, I would just call everybody and say, come another day. <laughs> Love your honesty, Bruce. What can I say? <laughs> you said it all. Yeah, but that, um, go ahead. Ooh, I'm sorry. Neil, what do you think about the office assistant, or you called it concierge? Should we have in the task manager even a special role like that? Because all request appointments go there, call campaigns are run by the concierge person, and Bruce, for, for sure, you too, but you haven't experienced the task manager yet. So that's why I was asking no. Neil. Uh, 
I don't know if I've experienced the task manager either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love the role of the of the office assistant, and that keeps you know if you have a strong advisor in place, that makes them you know like basically be able to stick around longer and get more done and be more effective. Um, just in the way that it worked here, that role didn't didn't work right off the bat. I'd see once we kind of fully optimize our production, we might be able to fit a concierge into the budget, but um, we just went, you know, a different way here instead, but that does right. work for a lot of people. It's, it's a good and, role. And, and can you, is there a simple um, rule for, for our audience to understand where is exactly the line between where the concierge stops and where the service advisor stops? Can that be well, defined? Uh, the, the, the office assistant or concierge would never talk to somebody about their car. Okay. They would never discuss their car. And if they're making an appointment, only a service advisor is allowed to make the appointment. The uh, service advisor has to talk to the customer so that we properly schedule what service is needed. We don't just arbitrarily, okay, they're coming in on that day. And next thing you know, I got you know, five 105 services with timing belts and valve adjustments that I can't get done in one day. Right. You know, along with the other stuff that's coming in because, uh, you know, the like I said, the service advisor needs to approve all the appointments. And, uh, you know, if customers continuously call and say, well, it's time for an oil change. Well, if, this, if the office assistant made every single car an oil change, well, then first they get to the counter and they're expecting to be there for an hour, an hour and a half and pay you know, 60 bucks. And, uh, and when they get there, the service advisor then tells them, you know, it's going to be 150 just to get started with a, with a service that's going to include a full inspection. And uh, that is going to take two hours or from, you know, hour and a half from the time we start, but the, to the time we get your inspection to you edited and uh, you got to set the expectations. So only the service advisor is allowed to do that. But uh, as far as controlling the phone, uh, cashiering, for example, that's done by the office assistant. Um, you know, imagine an op imagine a service advisor is busy. Uh, you know, they got two, three phones. They're trying to trying to take care of everybody. Maybe they got a tech waiting on them. Uh, they got a part they got to order. There's all this stuff is going on in their life, and the next thing you know, uh, uh, they got an issue with the credit card machine. Somebody's got to get on the phone with the, with the uh, merchant services to uh, try to straighten it out. Well, who's going to do that? Who's going to do it right then? Well, everything has to stop now. This guy has to stop because he's got a customer waiting to pay. Office assistant takes that whole role over. Also, we have rentals. We have our own rentals slash uh, loaners. Office assistants keep track of all of it. Um, they, they uh, you know, we have car rental software that we use and, and all, they do all of it. The service advisor does not get involved with that at all. As a matter of fact, the service advisor wants a loaner to give to somebody. For example, he's going to call somebody and sell a big job, and he wants to have that loaner in his pocket to give him. Uh, or he's running late. You know, we got an estimate back at 3 in the afternoon. There's no way we're going to get it done. He wants to know, do we have a loaner for this person? Um, he'll look to the office assistant to ask. Mm -hmm. The office assistant has to know. I mean, they do, they do a lot, really a lot. Sounds like somebody needs a raise. <laughs> hey, real quick, you know, I've got, uh, got a great, I, I got a great, uh, uh, you know, input here from Showroom, who I think is my good friend, Carlos Contreras, uh, our resident bolt-on user. He's saying that what if you're, if, if you have your technicians separate repairs and services by using numeric numbers from one to three, one is required, two is suggested, three equals maintenance. This way, the PM would, uh, the production manager would know how to separate the repair services by priority, and the service writer could prepare the presentation to properly advise the customer on what needs to be done now, uh, and or the second, uh, or, or for the second or third visit, the the PM could send the estimate to the ATEC for review before selling the repair or service. How is that different There's from bringing it over? Yeah, and then adding that, well, and I guess you could do that as a, as a, a secondary um, status or, a, you know. Uh, I think says colors me. do it just fine. Right. Yeah. 
I like the yeah. thinking though. Basically, he's talking about more communication between the technician and the and the right. estimate creator. Right. Um, and anything you can add to achieve that is is a win. Well, we use the numbers in severity of an oil leak, for example. Sure. Something like that. In the shop eyes only field. Yes. Mm, that goes in customer view for us. We explain the stages. Well, there's, the there's a drop down that goes to the customer view. Yes. Okay. Is that a can message with a video, or is or or do we just take the the shop eyes notes and edit them and clean them up, move them over? Bruce or me? Oh, either. Oh, sure. uh, how about you, Neil? Um, we used to have a video explaining how we how we recommend the stages, and um, I think people were actually watching it, which was cool. We took it off just for now, but um, they're just yeah the the buttons that the tech clicks. You know they they know you know what's a stage three versus a one, um, and then that automatically picks a color and everything. Oh yeah. So, so we can summarize the, the red, yellow, green is the most, is the simplest and most effective way of communicating within the shop and to the customer, right? There's no translation needed in between. The That's numbers correct. Just, the numbers just give a more level, layer of detail. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. <clears throat> Prioritization. And also, Carlos, you know, once you guys switch over to autopilot, you're able to create new severities and colors. So you could have purple as your maintenance items, something like that, right? That you could denote. We don't separate maintenance at all. You know, a maintenance item is just as important as anything else. If it's a if it's maintenance item that's needed, it goes into red. You know, for example, a transmission fluid that's really dark and needs to be flushed. Um, that's badly needed maintenance. It'll stay with red right along with worn out brake pads. I think we're talking about mileage based services though. So no matter what it looks like, if it's due based on mileage, do you put it in the red? That would go to yellow unless it looks, if, if it looks good, but it's due by mileage, that would go to yellow. Cool. But that's one of the selling points to a customer on the inspection rather than the mileage based services. Uh, a lot of a lot of customers are are uh, afraid of mileage based services because they've been told that they're that they're over servicing the car and when you when you sell a mileage service you got to uh, you got to qualify it and so um, you can either there's a lot of times we sell things before it's due by miles because of the inspection but I always tell the customer look I'm not going to service your car just because the maintenance manual says that we have to we're going to look at it and make sure it really needs it first and that that builds a lot of trust we got um got a little input from john long also and i think in a nutshell he's um describing you know telling us exactly why tech shouldn't be estimating is he said he missed the last 20 minutes of the show because he was on the phone uh trying to find an obscure hose for a dodge journey <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> Some that pulls a wagon in Texas. And um, but he said, but he's asking, would you expect your A tech? You know, I think back when we were talking about, you know, uh, having, you know, Adam's quite uh input about having that A tech running that team, would you be having your A tech do that, or would you pass that off to a lower tech or have the service advisor, estimator, production manager, um, slash 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 uh, person do that and have your tech making more money yeah finding parts isn't isn't on the tech's duties at all no um. <laughs> and I, my techs do not have access to the point of sale by the way not at all i don't want them in there at all they'll, just, they'll screw it up beyond belief i'm sure it's benefited yeah. to have we give the techs access they can order parts from our main vendors and that'll help too like if if they really just realize like, oh man, I forgot this O-ring or whatever, they know that they can order it to shortcut the process sometimes to keep things going. That requires another process with communication so that they can't just add things to tickets. But um, I kind of like being able to open up everything, um, 
you know, and, and trusting within our text not to mess with things. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So, in, so in your case, then that rear facing, you know, estimator uh, would kind of oversee that, right? He would see these things coming in or, or notice that this part was on order and, and then kind of have some oversight and management of that so that it doesn't just become the Wild West, right? Yeah, and they know there's a dollar yeah. limit, you know, and, and they actually usually will just in the, in the group chat right after like, hey, I had to order this part. Uh, it's on the way. And then, you know, the team will figure it out from there. Um, that's just, you know, all part of it. Um, and then, uh, Adam's over here firing shots in chat about John Long's uh, Dodge Journey. He says that his shop works on a lot of beep boxes. <laughs> so I don't know. You guys have to work that out on your own. Uh, when a, when a, uh, I don't allow my technicians to order parts at all either. That has to go through a service advisor that way and ensure that if there's an additional part, we make a decision on what the price is going to be for the customer and that the customer knows about it and that it's a, and that it gets charged on the ticket. I, I could foresee in my shop, if, if I let them order parts, I think I'd have uh, at the end of the month, a larger parts bill and go, wait a minute, what happened here? Why didn't I get paid for this stuff? <laughs> have to buy some shelves. Like yes. Your inventory. <laughs> yes, I've heard some stories. Yeah. Yeah, give, them, give them a credit card. Give them a blank check. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, oh, that wow. Some, that, was, uh, that was pretty amazing. Uh, Uvo over here thinking we weren't even going to give me half an hour. Uh, but you know that's what I said. You bring Neil and you bring Bruce in, and then sit back because you guys are in here dropping knowledge. I hope everybody uh, wrote that down. Don't worry, we're going to record it. We'll send it out. We'll post it up, and make it available to you if you didn't get to watch the entire episode because you were chasing Dodge Journey parts. Uh, well, then you can watch the recording. I uh, want to give a real quick um, uh, plug for our uh, Digital Shop Online Summit that's coming up October fifteenth. Um, you can go to, I believe it's the dig, yes, it is the digital shop summit.com to get registered, see who the uh, speakers are, what the breakouts are going to look like there uh, and get registered. You know, it's our continuation of, you know, our last digital shop summit. And unfortunately we were expecting to be kind of out of some of the restrictions and travel and we're hoping to do it more in person, but we're going to go online again this October 15th. Uh, the digital shop summit.com and Dustin just dropped that link there in the chat. If you want to go ahead and click that before the show ends, so you can get that uh, in your browser. Also get registered, register for the show. So you get the reminders, register on the Facebook form. If you're not in there already, because we really want to carry these ideas because I think we still have a couple things hanging. I mean, I, I could say we've come to a conclusion that, you know, in a digital shop, your technician should not be writing estimates. If they have access to the point of sale, that's under very controlled circumstances for a very specific reason. And it usually, it sounds like boils down to the one-off type stuff, the things that you're not used to seeing, and you're gonna need a little bit digging deeper. Some, some tech data, you know, looking at the guides, making, a, making an observation, you know, that thing seized and rusted on, you're adding the time, but that's all things that are, have to come from that tech. And through the digital uh, tools and the digital communication tools, uh, you know, I think we've determined a very good way to make that happen, to be able to communicate that information moving forward uh, so that everybody's on the same page. We get it right uh, the first time and we're not catching all those comebacks and, you know, working on stuff out of our own pocket. Um, Bruce, I want to thank you. It looks like Neil just got dropped. His internet, uh, you know, uh, revolted on him. But a huge thank you to Neil Daly also from Oceanside Motorsports for coming on. Great information. Bruce Nation can't thank you enough for coming in today, buddy, and uh, sharing some of that knowledge and giving people a peek under the hood on how you operate. Uh, I know that's a huge value to folks. Well, I hope it is. Thank you very much for having me. Always. Thank buddy. you, Bruce. Always. Always. And then, of course, to Adam and John, you know, our, our, our invisible uh, – component of our expert panel of experts. Uh, thanks as always. I uh, hope the lunch is good today, Johnny. Um, really good insight. Carlos Contreras, thank you very much. Uh, folks, you know, get in, 
give us an idea on what you want to hear. We're planning out kind of our next two or three months of shows. Send us in, email us in some topics, post it up on the Facebook forum. What you guys, uh, what challenges are you facing and what would you like us to discuss and, and hash out? And if you'd like to come on the show, we'll let us know that too. And we'll reach out with an invite. Uh, until then, tune in next Wednesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern uh, for the next edition of the Digital Shop Talk Radio. Until then, get out there and make some more money.